the month of love hallelujah there is a couple who asked me last night pastor jay uh we as christians uh, why do we uh, do we believe in valentines or uh, uh, why do we have to celebrate uh, uh valentine's day well basically i did not research about all of this but i know that valentine is a saint and uh we're there celebrating it but anyway uh just to give them a quick answer you know what we christians valentine's not february 14 valentine's is every day <laughs> isn't that a safe answer <laughs> so valentine's is not just february 14 for us christians but every day is valentine's day it is a day to celebrate the love that God has placed in our hearts and God's love for all of us amen but in reference to that I would like to take it to 1st Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 to 3 and in fact this is the love chapter it, ver it says in verse 13 if I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy but don't love I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate amen hallelujah how many of us have uh, have heard this from a song right so this is actually the taken from the message version and in verse uh, 14 uh, the next one if i speak god's word with power revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day and it, I have faith that says to a mountain jump and it jumps but I don't love I'm nothing. nada I'm nothing is there now another one if I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr but I don't love I've gotten nowhere so no matter what I say what I believe and what I do I'm bankrupt without love and all bankrupt people say amen <laughs> hallelujah praise the Lord that in itself is the message you know, I just would like just to sit down and just all of us just to meditate that today. <laughs> but no. Let me begin with the story. I don't know, probably some of us have heard this already from Pastor Noel or probably from me. But there was a story about an actor who was playing the part of Jesus Christ in the passion play in the Ozark and as he carried the cross up the hill a tourist began heckling or making fun of him and shouting insults of him finally the actor had taken all of it he could not take it no more so he threw down the cross he walked over to the tourist and he punched him out after the play was over the director told him you know I know he was a pest but I cannot condone what you did besides you are playing the part of Jesus and Jesus never retaliated so don't do anything like that again well the man promised that he would not but the next day the heckler was there again and this time it was even worse than the first day and so finally the actor exploded again and he punched out the second time the director said that's it I have to fire you we cannot have you behaving this while playing the part of Jesus but the actor begged please give me one more chance I really need this job and I can and he promised that he said that I can handle it if it happens again so the director decided to give him another chance and so the next day as he was carrying the cross up the street sure enough the heckler the pest was there again 
You could tell that the actor was really trying to control himself as the heckler is about to get the best of him as he was uh, insulting him and doing all of this thing against him. He was clenching his fist and grinding his teeth. Finally, he looked at the heckler and said, I will meet you after the resurrection. <laughs> What can we learn from that situation or from that play in itself? There are a lot. You know, to tell you the truth, God said that we are the representation of Jesus Christ or we are little Jesuses here on earth because that, we, that is what we were predestined to do, that Christ as the firstborn and then that all of us, we will all be transformed to the image of Jesus. So in short, the plan of God is to fill this earth with people like His Son Jesus. And so we are little Jesuses. And so we are, in some way, playing the part of Jesus. But how many times do we want? Just put down the cross and really punch somebody. You know, sometimes it is really hard for us, especially us Christians to behave like Christians at times agree oh come on people yes. say yes or I'm gonna throw my cross at you <laughs> we try to carry our crosses but if someone crosses us we tend to lose our composure and behave in much the same way like the rest of the world behaves at times when we're mad we even say things like you know what forget that I'm a Christian right now <laughs> and you can taste <laughs> the wrath of me But the Bible teaches us, people of God, since the, uh, this month is love month. The Bible teaches us that we are to be people who exercises love in all our relationship with one another. Pastor Jay, that's kind of tough. It is tough. But it is possible. In fact, there were particular scriptures that kind of encourage us. Like for instance, in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if it is possible, listen to me, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Can you do that, people? If it is possible, if it depends on you, meaning you can control it, meaning you have the upper hand to control, to let it, to allow it, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not be a war freak. Do not be the person who starts war. All war freaks say amen. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. All humble people say amen. amen. <laughs> I don't think you're humble. <laughs> All gentle people say amen. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Is this possible? To live in peace with all men and be holy? Is it possible? Amen? Is it? I don't think, Pastor Jay. <laughs> it is, I believe. That's why I am teaching you and telling you the truth and the word of God. All those scriptures that we just read say the same thing. It may be difficult sometimes and not everybody will be easy to love. But if it is possible, we are to live in peace and harmony with everyone. Do you agree that not everyone is easy to love? Amen. Yes, look at your neighbor. Ask them, are you easy to love? Or are you the challenging part? 
Are you the killing me softly? <laughs> kind of love. The message this morning will help us deal in getting along with other people. And in fact, we will be focusing in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is the lab chapter of the Bible. And this morning, we will look at the first three verses, which uh, Paul had began by saying, Now I will show you the most excellent way. That there is a, I would say, an excellent, or even the most excellent, or in short, this is the way. This is the top. First, let us bring to mind the importance of love in our lives. What is the importance of love in our lives? Paul was saying, I want to show you the best way to take care of virtually every situation. And that is the way of love. Then he points out that love is more important than five higher or five other things that Christians consider to be very, very important. There are five things that I would like to make mention today that we think as Christians to be so very significant and so very important. But even these five important things that we look at are not even higher than this one thing. And what is that? Let me go with the first one. In verse 1, Paul was saying that love is more important than spiritual gifts. In verse 1, it tells us that if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. It's not even a music. It's just a clanging gong, I mean a clanging cymbal or a resounding gong. I mean gong, if you, uh, I mean if you sound it one, it will be at least okay. But if you keep on banging a gong, it becomes a noise. And if you keep on clanging those cymbals, they're not music anymore. They become what? They become irritation. They become a nuisance. You don't want to hear them. And even at times your wife, if your wife is talking and talking and talking, become a clanging cymbal. And, right? Or your husband is talking and talking. It's unfair. It's always the wife. How about the husband now? Amen. It's just a clanging symbol. Are you with me? Amen. It becomes a noise. It irritates the ear. On the day of Pentecost, the very first gospel sermon was ever preached. God gave the apostles the gift of being able to speak in languages that they have never learned so that the people all around them who have heard them, they were able to understand what was being said. So that in itself is a very important gift because the gift of tongues is, is a supernatural gift. Imagine you are talking French that you have never spoken French for, for the rest of your life, but you are speaking French so fluently. Bourgeois. <laughs> Miswa <laughs> Canton <laughs> But they were so amazed during that time because it shows the power of God speaking in a known language and so fluent and declaring the praises of God in a known language they have never spoken before. And so that in itself, it's kind of amazing. But Paul is saying that if God gave him the gift of speaking in tongues of every human language and even heavenly language that only angels can understand. But he, if he did not have love, then he would be nothing more than like what I've said, a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, what did he mean about the gong or the cymbal? Back in the first century, there was a big gong or a cymbal hanging at the entrance of most pagan temples. So when people come to worship inside those temples, all those people need to do first is to what? They need to, to sound the gong or to strike the cymbal or to make a noise. Why? To awaken the gods. 
so that when they pray, the gods are already awake. <laughs> when they pray so that's why they are making all these noises before they enter the temple that is why there is that resounding gong or clanging symbol Paul is saying that even if he were so blessed that he could speak with the greatest of, uh, of eloquence in every language but he did not have love then his life would be useless as this ridiculous pounding on gong to awaken the non-existent gods so you see love is more important than spiritual gifts I would rather have love in my heart love for others than being the most gifted spiritually there is Amen. Amen. Because that is how God sees the importance of love on this aspect. And then in verse 2, Paul said that love is more important than knowledge. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries, meaning I could understand and I could explain all the mysteries there is. And all knowledge is that, but have not love, still I am nothing. So he was saying that even if we know it all, even if we know everything there is to know about things around us, probably about nuclear science, or probably in medicine or even about philosophy psychology theology and all the ology out there if you know it all but have no love then you are nada it has always amazed me because when people look at our society and when people are trying to analyze what is wrong with our society why people are killing people and why they are why they are abusing one another that there will be experts who would always seem to come back with the same answer and what the answer would be is that we need more education if only we could get everybody be educated then probably we won't have these problems anymore but you know what? I don't think that education is the answer. I believe in the importance of education, but education in itself will not solve all the problems in our society. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, it tells us there, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If God had blessed you with so much knowledge, you have the ten tendency to become so proud and arrogant. And that in itself is not really beneficial and helpful for humankind. But there is one thing really that builds. There is something that is helpful. There is something really that you and I need. And what is that? As we love one another, we are building one another up. We're not stepping on one another, but we build one another. So I don't think that we need more knowledge near as much as we need more love. We need a whole lot more of love and the hearts of people need to change before the society will change. It is not education but it is the hearts of people like you and me that need to change and as we change our society change as well amen the third one Paul says that love is more important than faith what I don't believe that Pastor Jay well in verse 3 if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love still we are nothing but like what I've said can you believe that 
is not faith important? It is important. Now he doesn't say that faith is not important. He just say that love is more important than faith. It's not, he, he's not saying that faith is not essential or faith really is not needed. No, he did not. He just said that faith is important, but love is more important than faith. Faith, we are told in the scripture, is really important that it is impossible to please God without faith. Amen? And I trust that all of us this morning have faith. Do you have faith? Can you ask your neighbor, do you have faith? You got to have faith, the faith, the faith. <coughs> But what is your faith? What do you believe for sure this morning? What is your faith? Do you believe that God is the creator of the universe? Amen? Amen? Or you are the center of the universe? You are a bell almighty. <laughs> I've, I've heard that last night. A bell almighty. <laughs> Do you believe that God is the creator of the world? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is his only begotten son? And that Jesus has come into this world and lived a sinless life. And that he died and he was buried and on the third day he rose again. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he is now at the right hand of God the Father and that he is preparing a place for you and for me and that one day this Jesus will come back again for us? Do you believe that? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit is our guide and our counselor and our comforter? Amen? Amen? If we believe all of these things, then that is well, and that is good, and I highly commend you for it. But the Bible tells us that if we believe all the right stuff, just like what I have mentioned, but you do not have love, again I tell you, you are nothing. Because even faith is of no value unless it is backed up by love. Amen. Do you still recall the story of the Good Samaritan? The Good Samaritan in the Bible, Jesus has, give, has given a parable. That one day there's a man who was traveling on the road. And this man, he encountered some um, robbers. So what happened is that all that this person possessed was taken away by these robbers. And not only that, not only was he stripped off of everything is gone, but he was beaten, almost dying on the road. And then Jesus, as he told the story, that there were three kinds of people who passed this dying man on the road. The first one was a Levite. You know who a Levite is? A Levite is somebody who served God in the temple. In short, a Levite is a Christian. But that Christian, instead of helping that man dying on the street, he walked or he crossed another road. He avoided that man that needs help. And the second person that passed, do you know who that second person is? He's a priest. A priest is somebody who served God. Imagine Levite and priest. These are the people who knows the Bible. They know everything in the scripture. Are you with me? In fact, we would say that they have the faith. And the third man is a Samar Samaritan from Samaria. If you are a Jew, you do not want to associate with a Samaritan. Because there is 
discrimination racially and spiritually because Jews do not associate themselves because these are not the children of Abraham these are not children of God these are dirty people we should never associate ourselves with lest we become contaminated with their dirt so in short they look at them as dirt but this dirty man this dirt man was the man who helped this dying man on the road not that religious person, not that priest, not these people who have so much faith in their God and yet it's not translated with their work. Amen. So if we have such kind of faith but we don't have love, you are nothing. If you say you are a Christian and yet you do not take pity, you do not have compassion on those who need help, your faith is useless. Are you with me today? Because Jesus himself had said that if you have faith and yet there is no love in your heart, that faith is useless. It's nothing. In a way, Jesus was humiliating all those hypocrites. And who are these hypocrites? These are the religious people who think they are closer to God because of their knowledge and their faith that they were chosen. But Jesus said, no, nah, it means nothing. What I really am looking is truly the heart. And Jesus commanded this dirty in their eyes man. But he was the one who really took the time to take care of this dying man on the street. Are you with me people? Do not be proud and arrogant with what you know about God. Because later on that in itself would never count. But what God really wants to see out from us is that our faith is being translated in our lives. That our faith is being seen with the way we lived our lives, with our words and with our action. I don't care if you could quote the scripture from cover to cover, but if they don't see the life in us, it means nothing. Hallelujah. In fact, Paul have said that I want to read the scripture and I want to read the scripture in your life. I want to see the scripture being lived in your life. I don't want you to quote the scripture out from your mouth. I want to see it in your life being lived every day. Are you with me today, people? It's not enough that we know a lot about the Bible. We have to live what we know. Amen. And I pray that what we learn really changes us every day. As we go to work, as we go to school. We are being changed by the word of God that we hear every day. Because the dangerous thing is that we hear the word of God and we remain unchanged. That is just a problem. We become so immune with the word of God. That it doesn't have any effect on us anymore. We're not being touched, moved, and changed, and renewed, and transformed. That is just a problem. We know so much of the Bible, but it doesn't show in our life. What happens, we become religious hypocrites. Just like those religious people during the time of Jesus, that the Son of God was already there, but still they were so blinded. They have not seen Him as the Son of God, but they have seen Him as an, as, as an enemy. Are you with me today? Amen. Another one. The fourth one, love. Okay, in Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That is real faith, people of God. Even, um, it, um, who is this? Was it John who said, or Paul who have said, he have faith, then uh, he have works, I have faith. But he has said that faith without work is dead. Amen? Did you say you have faith? Then I have work. Faith without work is died. Meaning it's nothing. Are you with me today? So that's why the only thing that counts is faith that is being expressed itself through love. 
The fourth one. Love is more important than generosity. Paul says, if I give all I possess to the poor, but have not love, I gain nothing. Please take note. He did not say that he gave his first fruit offering or he gave his 10%. He said that if I give all, everything, everything I possess, if I empty all my checking accounts, if I give all of my retirement accounts, if I sell my house, if I encash all my insurance policies, and if I sit on the corner with nothing left but what I'm wearing, and if I have given all, everything to help the poor, but I don't have love, then I am nothing at all. You see, people of God, generosity is not even enough. Generosity is important. Generosity accomplishes a lot. But, listen to me, but in itself, it's not enough if it is not backed up by love. My question, are you a generous person? Can you look at your neighbor again? Are you generous? Are you generous? But my next question is this. But why do you give? Why do you give? Again, I would ask you again, why do you give? What is your motivation as you give? Do you give because Pastor Noel, with all the veins in his neck, just preaches every time that I need to give. Do you give because you feel guilty if you don't? We feel guilty that if I don't give, I would feel so guilty. Do you give because you want to impress others? Oh, you know what? I think I need to stand up so that everyone will know that I am always giving. Do you give because you are afraid that God will get you if you don't? Oh, you know what? I think I need to give. Unless God will take all of this away from me. I need to give. Do you give because you will get more than you give? You know, I want to tell you there are people who give because they want more to return. I mean, that is a promise from the Bible. But people of God, listen to me. If that in itself, everything that we are going through, we are giving for the wrong reasons. What do you mean, Pastor Jay? Like, for instance, I know that true enough that if we give, we will receive. And praise God for Brother Richard and Sister uh, Colleen as they have given, they already have received. But some of us, we will be asking God, God, they already have received theirs. But what about me, God? It's been how many weeks now? I have not received it yet, God. What's going on, God? Are you sleeping, God? Did you not see my offering, God? Probably it's got lost, God. <laughs> Why am I talking like this? Because we have given for the wrong reasons. We are now anticipating, though I know that is an after effect of what we give, but what if God, amen, will have other things planned in his mind? What if God will give your answer on December 31st at 23.59. <laughs> Amen? Because God has his own way of doing things and not every one of us will be like the Wonsons that we will be getting it on one time or a specific date. Are you going to lose your faith? People of God, listen to me. The motivation why you give your tithe and even your offering and even your first fruit it's because you love God and you want to honor Him. Praise God if the reward or even if, if the return will come to me. But you know, as far as I'm concerned, God had blessed me so much and I am contented with what I have right now. Amen. And praise be to God. The reason I give is because I love Him and He's first in my life.
I'm sure all of you, people of God, you who truly loves, when you give your spouse or when you give your children, when you give your loved ones something, you're not really expecting something in return. Because you really give because you love them without really expecting anything. Are you with me? Is that true? Amen. Or you're expecting? Automatic? I don't think so. Because if I would give, I won't be anticipating or expecting anything. Because really, giving in itself for me will be a joy. And seeing the expression of somebody uh, getting excited and being so happy, in itself is a reward on my part. Amen. 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 And if I, if I, if I give, uh, you know what, we are, I mean, we're in the, I mean, we're enjoying baking and cooking. If I, at one point, I gave Sister Abel a, a, a huge cake. And if I would see Sister Abel, Pastor Jay, that cake is so good, it's so delicious. That in itself is a reward on my part because they enjoyed what I have given. On my part, I have given, and that in itself is a reward as I have given. Amen. And I'm not anticipating that she would reward me with another cake <laughs> because I might not eat it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But my point in all of this, as we give to the Lord, our motivation is because we love. We honor Him. Amen. Hallelujah. Another one, accomplishments. Then he says that love is more important than Accomplishments. If I surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Again, Paul is talking about martyrdom. Are you ready to be martyred? Look at you. Are you a candidate to be a torch, a human torch? Probably you've got extra fats. Oh, you know what? I think these fats really will be flammable. <laughs> You know, he's talking about being so faithful and so committed to God that you end up dying because of your faith. How deep is your faith? How deep is your faith? Your faith. I mean, we danced that last night and everyone enjoyed it. How deep is your faith? How deep is your commitment? Are you willing to lay down your life for God? If it came to that? But Paul is saying that even if we go to church every time the church doors are open, if we read our Bible faithfully, if we pray and do all the things that a Christian person ought to do and should do, but if there is no love behind all that we are doing, then it is nothing. So in essence, Paul is saying that love is more important than spiritual gifts than knowledge, than faith, than generosity, and than all the things that you have accomplished for the kingdom of God. Love is important. So obviously love is important, much more maybe than we ever realized before. But in John chapter 13 verse 34, I don't know if it's in there. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Notice that Jesus said that this is a commandment. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. It's not if probably you can. If you can do it or if it is possible. No. It is a commandment. Are you with me? Probably by now we know what a commandment and what a suggestion is. A suggestion is something that you may or may not do. But a commandment is something that whether we like it or not, we have to do it because it is a command. Are you with me today? Is that clear? And God never commands us to do anything that we cannot do. Jesus came here on earth. One reason why Jesus came here on earth to become humans like us is so that Jesus himself will experience what humans experience every day. Temptations, weakness, getting hungry, and things like that. So when Jesus had uh, become human like us, he knew us. Everything that we are going through. 
And so when he has said this word, that love one another as I have loved you, Jesus really is giving that emphasis that as he has done it, we can do it as well. Amen. That we can love one another. You know, all of us, we, we tend to think that love is something that just happens to us because that is what the world teaches. It is just like that magical thing that when you look at somebody and you fall in love, that is just something that, uh, that, that Hollywood had teaches about. That love is just something that happens in the twinkling of an eye. You fall in love like you fall in a ditch. Or you fall out of love like you fall out of a tree. You cannot help it. It is something that just happens to you, people of God. Mm -mm, it's not. Amen. And if I may wake you up today, you're not in Hollywood. <laughs> this is real life. Amen. And let me tell you again, you're not the bachelor or the bachelorette. That you could just manufacture love. I don't know if that even is real love. They're getting married. I, I don't know if that is really love. I think it's attraction or just getting attracted to one another. But a few days later, they'll, they'll be divorcing themselves. I mean, people in Hollywood, it's so plastic. It's so hypocrite. I mean, they would prepare for their wedding for two to three years. Preparation for the wedding. And then they'll spend together one month. And then another two years for divorce claiming what should be theirs. Isn't that ironic? That we glamorize and we look at these people so very idealistic, but their lives are a mess. People of God, wake up. Amen. That is not the real world. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. It looks so beautiful. It looks so fancy and so glamorous, but it's not. Hallelujah. Are you with me, people? Amen. The life you live right now, that is the real life. I know we all love those songs. I can't help falling in love with you. Or probably, you've lost that loving feeling. <laughs> or, I want to know what love is. <laughs> I want you to show me. I, I, Sister Tanette's theme song said, I love him, but I lied. <laughs> I don't even know that song. I don't know the tune. Does Brother Patrick know that already? That, that is your theme song, I love him, but I lied. People of God, listen to me. The Bible teaches us that love is something that we can control. It is not beyond our control. There is no real Cupid there that is really striking your heart. And after that, you are falling out. <laughs> Amen. Probably by now we know that there is no real Santa Claus. As there is no real Tooth Fairy. <laughs> and Crystal really was crying. No, don't tell me that there is no Tooth Fairy. No. <laughs> I told him, yes, it's true. There is no Tooth Fairy. Just like there is no Santa Claus. But he's going to give me money. <laughs> I told her, mommy and daddy will just give you the money, so stop crying. <laughs> People of God, God commands us to love each other, which means I can will to love you. Amen. And you in turn can will to love me. So this is not a hopeless situation at all. Amen. We can will, meaning we can it's not something that it is out of control, but we can will to love one another. What kind of love is being talked about here? In Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says he wants us to behave as Jesus Christ behaved. In other words, to love like Jesus loved, the same way that Jesus loved. And even, and here is the way Jesus loved. Are you curious how Jesus loved? Are you curious on how Jesus loved? 
This is how he loved. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. That is how Jesus loved. Not you all the time. Amen. Look at the other person. Look at your spouse. Look at your kids. Look at your neighbor. Look at others. Amen. Are you with me and not you all the time? That is how Jesus have loved. It is a selfless love. In other words, love becomes unselfish. You begin to think about other people and their interests just like you think about yourself and your interest. You become unselfish. Amen. And how can we apply this? There are three things and I would end here. The first one, the practice of love in our lives every day. Let love work in the family. Let us suppose that someone is, in, uh, is represented this morning. Every family is represented here in this morning. Telling yourself, you know what? I'm going to go home today and put everything I've heard, everything that Pastor Jeff said, and put it into practice. Start with your spouse. Start with your wife. Start with your husband. You ought to love your husband or your wife first and foremost. Of course, after God. You ought to be kinder, more tender, more gentle. Just like to start to net, gentle. To them, even if they are behaving like a beef jerky. Like a jerk. Begin first in your marriage relationship. Probably if we become a little bit more, okay, a little bit more loving, a little bit more of not looking at our own interests, but look. You know, last night there were so much uh, advices really that, that really uh, st it, it struck the point that we need... Uh, we need to give time to, uh, to our spouse. We need to give them importance. Uh, we should not um, butt in whenever they're talking. You know, all of these things. And you couples that were here last night, somehow you have had an idea on, on how we should do that. Probably if we would start doing that, would, do you think would it not affect the atmosphere in our, in our home? If the spouse, if the husband and wife would start just looking after one another's interest. And the not me all the time. Probably the bickering, the arguing, the sharp words be between each other will stop. Amen. And if the relationship between husband and wife improved... I believe that it will also affect our relationship with our children. Amen. Hallelujah. It was said that the best way to love our children is by loving our spouse. Because as they see us loving our spouse, they see that and they feel secure in that. Are you with me today? Amen. Amen. You don't agree with me? <laughs> so, start first with the family. Okay? And then, after it began in the family, it spills over into the church family. Because you are happy couple, happy couple go to church together and they bring happiness to church. And if they are happy, they worship the Lord happy and freely. Mm -hmm. They smile. Mm -hmm. They give joy. Mm -hmm. They bring encouragement to others. Mm -hmm. A happy family brings happiness to a church. And if all the happy family gathers together, it becomes a happy church. Are you with me? Amen. 
if a couple, if a loving couple, a loving family comes to church, that love also will transcend to the, rest, to, to the rest of the congregation. And so the whole congregation becomes what? A loving church as well. But on the other hand, if you or your spouse have a quarrel, have a fight, okay? You just have beaten one another. Or you have just uh, beaten, I mean, you, you just bite one another. And then, and you come here at church, you are beaten red and blue. And when the worship leader said, come on people, let's worship the Lord. Go on people, come on. Leave your hands and then you're there. <laughs> you cannot. Because you've just been to war. You cannot leave your hands because you're so heavy. You cannot leave your hands because you are just struggling. But if only we have learned to look after the interest of others first, even before us. Amen. In Tagalog, magpatalo ka na. How do we translate that? In English, give way or be a loser. Give it up for the sake of, of peace. <laughs> let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. <laughs> Amen. The problem at times is pride. We don't want to give up. We want us our own. We want to be the king or the queen of the world. That belongs to them, people. <laughs> so don't get that title. <laughs> so don't be the king and the queen. Okay, give way. I mean, I may be sounding funny, but this is reality at times. At times, husband and wife, before we come to church, there are just little arguments. At times, they are they're not even worth fighting about. But then we come to church so hot-headed and so irritated and so really so messed up because of arguments. It's because somebody did not really give in or have given the way. Somebody had just really taken up so much interest of himself or herself. That's why we come to, to church already down. Right, Kuya Tony? Amen. Are you with me, people? Yes. yes. So that's why happy family comes to church and bring happiness to the church. And happy church, a loving church, is made up of happy and loving family. Hallelujah. Amen. And I pray as you come to church, you bring joy and happiness and not your wrath and not people. Oh no, oh no, here is sister. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I think I really need to hold on because I don't want to see her wrath and her fury. I think something happened at their home and look at them. Oh boy, I could not just paint the face. I hope not, people. Please, I'm giving you warning before even you enter that door. Whatever argument and you have. I'm not saying that you're going to be hypocrites pretending that everything's okay. The Bible says that even before you come to the Lord to offer your sacrifices, settle it. Stay in your car. Amen. And tell one another, we will not leave this, this car until this thing got settled. <laughs> or else. <laughs> Don't go home. That in itself is not an excuse for you to go home. Are you with me today? Amen. And then, finally, we are to let that love flow into the workplace too. Or even to the school place for those students that are here. We do it when we show those people who work next to us that Jesus Christ is our Lord. Not just with words, but by the example that we said. But Pastor Jay, I have a hard boss that I don't like very much. Well, praise God, blessed are you. You are blessed. What do you mean, Pastor Jay? You are blessed. Amen? 
can I change my job? Well, ask God first if He wants you to change your job. Or probably we may be working with people who makes fun of us with the way we live or, or us being Christians or us praying before eating. You know, at one point, I don't know who among us who told the story that um, he's a young person that he's so, um, he's so ashamed to pray for his food because of being ridiculed by his friends. So that's why whenever he's uh, with his friends and because he's convicted not to pray for the food, so what he does is that he will throw a tissue uh, behind the floor. And then uh, he would pretend that he would pick the, the tissue. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for this food in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> and then he would, pick, <laughs> he would pick the tissue and then he prayed. <laughs> but uh, he prayed, uh, Jesus, thank you. <laughs> well, at least under the table prayer. <laughs> because he's so afraid he'll be ridiculed. But you see, people of God, I mean, I don't know how you're praying I mean in front of people but is there something shameful I mean to pray for the food I know people will be there to ridicule you with the way I mean we express our faith praying for food and even one point why do you pray for your food God did not give that food well the man said I am thanking the Lord that because he is the one who have supplied this but this man said you know what? How did you know it comes from God? Well, I'm being grateful, the, the Christian said. You know what? The Christian said, I have somebody at home who just eat without praying. And then the man said, who is that? My dog. He eats without praying. <laughs> so, people of God, I know this would come. Amen. There will be people that will be, become enemies because of the way we lived our lives. But Jesus said that we are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Hallelujah. Amen. I know this is already so tattered. You already have heard this one million times before. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. I know we know this, but at times during that, in that real situation, it is really kind of hard. Especially if you feel if if you if you feel the offense and the insult, your blood really is just boiling, and you just want to get your Bible and smack them in the head. Well, for once, the Bible has a good use, but that is not really what God wants us to use the Bible to smack somebody, but really to use and let it live. Romans twelve twenty to twenty one. If your enemy is hungry. Feed him. Oh, wow, Pastor Jay, that's a great opportunity. Feed him. Do I need to put some uh, rat poison in there? P feed him, Pastor Jay. Yes, that's good. Or probably put a lot of, um, what's that, laxative? Put some uh, something in there that really would, uh, no, don't do that. I'm not suggesting that you're going to do that. In fact, that's a sin. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And if we do that, the Bible says that we are putting coals into their head. Amen? Because in spite of the fact that they're doing all of this evil against us, but we are showing them good. Because that is what Jesus would have done. Amen. I know it's easier said than done, especially if we are in that situation, especially if we are faced with this person that ever since the world began, he or she has been our heckler. She's the one who is throwing insult to us all the time. But you know what? This is how we can practice our faith. Probably change the way we look at them. When they come to you, you know what? I thank God for you. Because you are my unpaid critic. I thank God for you because because of you, amen, the character of Jesus is just flowing in me right now. Amen. Hallelujah. 
I know you won't actually say those things, <laughs> but I'm just really giving you the point in all of this. And let me end here. There is a story about Doug Nichols. I don't know if I have read this already before, but this is really to wrap everything up and really just to give a point to all that I have spoken to you. There is a story about Doug Nichols who went to India to be a missionary there. But while he is just starting to study the language, he became infected with tuberculosis. And he had to be put in a sanitarium. So he was placed in an institution in there. It was not a very good place to be. It was not very clean and conditions were difficult because there were so many sick people there. But Dog decided to do the best he could in that situation. So he took a bunch of Christian books and tracts and literatures and tried to witness to the other patients in the sanitarium. But when he tried to pass out tracts, gospel tracts, the small leaflets that tells about Jesus, they were rejected. No one wanted them. He tried to hand out books, but no one would take them. He tried to witness, but he was handicapped because of his inability to communicate in their language. And so he felt so discouraged. Here he was. Because of his illness, he would be there for a long time. But it seemed like the work that he had been sent to do would not be done because no one would listen to him. Because of his tuberculosis every night, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, he would wake up with chronic coughing that would not quit. Then one night when he awoke, he noticed across the aisle an old man trying to get out of bed. He said the man would roll himself up into a little ball and teeter back, forth, back and forth trying to get up the momentum to get up and stand on his feet. But he could not just do it. He was too weak. Finally, after several attempts, the old man laid back and wept. The next morning, Dog understood why the man was weeping or was crying. He was trying to get to the bathroom, to get up to go to the bathroom, and did not have enough strength to do that. So his bed was a mess, and there was a smell in the air. The other patients made, made fun of him, made fun of the old man. So the nurses came to clean up his bed and they were not kind to him either. In fact, one of them even slapped him in the face. Dog said that the old man just lay there and cried. Dog said the next two nights, the next night about two o'clock, Dog said I started coughing again. I looked across the way and there was the old man trying to get out of bed once more. I really didn't want to do it, but somehow I managed to get up and I walked across the aisle and I helped the old man stand up. But he was too weak to walk, so Dog said, I took him in my arms and I carried him like a baby. He was so light that it wasn't a difficult task. I took him to the bathroom which was nothing more, than a, nothing more than a dirty hole in the floor. And I stood behind him and cradled him in my arms as he took care of himself. Then I carried him back to his bed and laid him down. As I turned to leave, he reached up and grabbed my face and pulled me close and kissed me on the cheek and said, what I think was, thank you. Doug said, the next morning, there were patients waiting when I woke up. And they asked if they could read some of the books and tracts that I had brought them. Others had questioned about the God I worshipped and His only begotten Son, who came into the world to die for their sins. Doug Nichols says that in the next few weeks, he gave out all the literature that he had brought and many of the doctors and nurses and patients in that sanitarium came to know Jesus Christ 
as their Lord and their Savior too. He said, now what did I do? What did I do? I did not preach a sermon. I could not even communicate in their language. I did not even have a great lesson to teach them. I did not have wonderful things to offer. All I did was to take an old man to the bathroom. And anyone can do that. Amen. Amen. And someone has said, they will not care how much you know until they know how much you care. People of God, that story kind of wrapped everything that I have spoken about. You know, it's not really the talking or the things that, that we could do. But just little. I would, I would not even say significant actions or significant things. But even little things that probably would be nothing for others. But for others, it would mean so much. Are you with me today? Yes. 